we have, so I'd like to get to audience questions, but before we do, I want to tag team with Patty here to ask this final question, which looks at the broader regional landscape. And when we look at US, Japan, Korea, trilateral cooperation in the broader context of the regional architecture, we also have the Quad, we have AUKUS, we have these initiatives with the Pacific Islands, with ASEAN. Um, this is all terrific in terms of strengthening uh, allies and partnerships, these relationships in, in the region. But there are some uh, actors, there are some uh, allies and partners that may feel a bit uneasy that perhaps uh, we're going too far ahead. And I'm wondering if uh, how can we uh, ensure for those that feel that, uh, that these steps would be actually undermining regional st stability, how we can reassure allies and partners. I think Patty has a similar question and in to, a different way, in a different angle. To tag onto that, um, you know, China has often complained that trilateral cooperation is really against China. This is a mini NATO that's encircling China. And so would you say that these deepening trilateral ties is impacting uh, the United States' ability to diplomatically engage or stabilize relations with Beijing. Okay, I'll try to answer, and then I think Mir will have something to say. So I think Andrew's question was initially about the response of allies and partners, and I think Patty's good question is about China. I, I would simply say I am not aware of any country in the Indo-Pacific that is uh, critical or resistant of the steps that we have taken. In fact, behind the scenes, even some countries that might surprise you have been very welcoming of our engaging um, with a host of countries and, and a series of efforts to, um, to need together to, to build greater resiliency and creativity in multilateral and minilateral uh, groupings. And so, Andrew, to be honest, I'm not aware of any country that says, wait, you're going too far. If anything, the question is, can it be sustained? Can you ensure that these important commitments can be taken into the future? And we hear that sometimes in the Pacific and sometimes in Southeast Asia. And I think we have a much greater confidence now that I believe that the American um, engagement in the Indo-Pacific is here to stay and that um, uh, this is now fully uh, embedded in uh, the American system, embraced in a bipartisan way, and will be resourced and sustained into the future. Patty, to your good question, the only thing I would say, and I, I actually, one of the things that Ram has brought to this realm is plain speaking. Um, and so oftentimes we About hear... About four-letter words. Yeah. <laughs> He's done very little of that, actually. Um, what, one of the things that we've seen, of course, is this idea that these steps are in some way encircling. Almost every country that we work with, I can assure you, does not see it in those terms. They feel, in many respects, under unimaginable pressure. Huge... Uh, uh, pressures economically, dipl diplomatically, and militarily. They also believe that the last 40 or 50 years are some of the best years in the history of the Indo-Pacific. Remarkable prosperity, tremendous wealth creation, tremendous innovation and integration, lifting billions of people out of poverty. It's nothing to sneeze at. It's very substantial. And they believe that elements of this operating system are coming under duress. That's natural that a rising state seeks to adjust elements of the existing system. But I think many of these countries believe that steps that China is taking won't just amend the system, but will destroy it or make it uh, much less viable as an institution to propel prosperity and peace. And so what they are looking for is confidence to work and act together to sustain a system that will still evolve in important ways, but to sustain a system built on the rule of law, on freedom of navigation, peaceful resolution of disputes, and understanding that the American role is critical in the maintenance of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific all of these things, I think these countries think are important. And so, Patty, I, I just would simply say that I don't think many countries accept the idea that this is somehow a, um, a, a noose or an effort to contain 
uh, China. All these countries have deep, profound economic and political interests uh, in a steady and stable relationship with China. What they sense and what they witness is a China whose actions have demonstrably changed in recent years in ways that threaten their security uh, and that raise uh, larger concerns both nationally and in the region. What I'll add here, Patty, um, is the tack that we plan to take, right, with this trilateral partnership. What, what you can expect to see from us and what, uh, what message I think that will send to the region. Um, and that is going to be an overwhelmingly affirmative message. One of the many beauties of the moment that we are living in with this extraordinary alignment between the U.S., Japan, and ROK is that this is no longer a partnership that is solely focused on security from a single threat actor um, in a narrow set of issues. This is a broad and deep partnership that touches so many different aspects of what we do in the Indo-Pacific. So one of the central messages you're going to hear from us on Friday is that this is now a partnership for the whole Indo-Pacific. One of the many major changes that has come out of the ROK under the UN administration is that the ROK issued its very first Indo-Pacific strategy, which puts us in a position with Japan and the ROK to be able to work side by side in the full implementation of our highly complementary strategies all over the region. You know, some of the deliverables that we discuss on Friday will include ways that we can work together better in Southeast Asia, how we can work together better in the Pacific Islands, how we can work together better to reinforce the regional economic order and to provide more effective and efficient security and development assistance. These are all things that our partners in the Indo-Pacific want and they need and that our countries individually are already delivering, but we can do better if we're standing together. So like the lens that is on our Indo-Pacific strategy, the way that we have fashioned the quad, our aim is to show that everybody is better off when these three countries are working together because it happens to be true. I, I'm assuming, I know you want to get to questions, uh, but as I like to say, does anybody have questions for my answers? So I'm just going to go, <laughs> right. I'm gonna go look, <laughs> nobody in the region wants an untethered, unanchored China. If you think this starts at the trilats, the problem, we got to go back to zero here. I think President Biden doesn't get the full credit, in my view, for having China basically in the region will never win the award for the good neighbor policy. They have land conflict with India. They just fired water cannons at the Philippines uh, Coast Guard and operation. They're in conflict constantly on the Senkaku Islands and violating that EEZ. They fired five missiles on Japan's EEZ post Nancy Pelosi's visit. They've had economic coercion as recently as 2017 against Korea, and then just ending that with Australia. That is, and that is, I'm just doing it by memory, and I'm probably missing half of it. This region is desperate for more of America, all of America, not just its strategic, not just its uh, uh, battleships, not just, but its political front, its economic front, its engagement with the region. China is unanchored, untethered, is a risk to the region. And the fact is, in the region, whether it's the Quad, whether it's this new trilat, what was left off your list, with also Philippines making major efforts with us on the islands, whether it's AUKUS, is a restructuring because people understand and, and, and in strengthening of America's alliance and commitments to the region. And in fact, that is exactly, it's welcomed. And I can tell you that on the diplomatic side, across the spectrum, not just with developed countries, but uh, Pacific Islands, others in the region, how much of my colleagues in, the, in Tokyo are so appreciative about what's about to happen on Friday. And so I would actually say the inverse, which is when it comes to disruption or caution, is not the trilateral process. It's actually all the coercion and the conflict and the constant uh, harassing of others on a geographic basis or resource basis or the, what's going on in fishing rights, water, uh, mineral rights, what's going on on uh, resources uh, exploration. That is what's actually disruptive. Great, thank you. Well, we're going to turn it over to Q&A now. Uh, we'll go with the gentleman first here. And if you can identify your name and affiliation. and uh, Hi, uh, Dimitri with the Financial Times. And I'd just like to say I think we should W Casey and the Sunshine Band with all the optimism up there. Um, my question is, do you think what's happening on Friday is going to be when historians look back 
the first important step towards a collective security agreement between the three allies. And separately, will you also mention anything about the second Thomas Scholl in the statements on Friday? So, look, um, uh, Dimitri, I think the, the agreements and the engagements on, um, on Friday will be a substantial step forward in recognizing the common security picture that each of the countries are facing along the lines that Ambassador Emanuel and Mira have indicated. We are taking some initial quite substantial steps towards recognizing that we face a common horizon and that it will require common actions. Um, I think those are substantial steps. Um, I think we can imagine a future uh, with more ambition but I think it's very careful, like you, you opened your comments by saying a lot of optimism up there. The, the key is not to get too far over your skis, to take this a step at a time, to build appropriately, to not get beyond the domestic context of which we are dealing. Each country has the confidence in the strongest possible relationship with the United States and we will uh, explore how to extend elements of those bilateral engagements into a trilateral setting. But we will do it prudently, we will do it carefully, and we will do it responsibly. And then I do want to just underscore that when Mira says that these leaders share our views about um, uh, a uh, common security environment. Uh, I think we will hear the leaders speak uh, together about the situation in Ukraine and the need for vigilance. You will hear commentary and statements about the need to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. You will hear also uh, a view that um, uh, abiding by uh, international law in uh, international waterways is a central feature of the maintenance of peace and stability. So I think you will see a broad gauged uh, set of uh, documents and statements that reinforce the common purpose of each of the three leaders. And all I would say, Dimitri, is you have to stand by till Friday to hear the exact specifics, and hopefully you'll, you'll be depressed by then again. So not so optimistic. <laughs> No, I know. <laughs> okay. Next Mira, question, do you want to please. A couple questions. Yeah, we'll maybe we'll collect two yeah, or three. Thank you. We'll be happy to right do that. Right here and then over there. I think my name is Ken Skiabe from Marubeni Corporation. So my question is whether uh, Taiwan issue and the uh, outward investment uh, restriction uh, uh, the, uh, one of the agendas in the summit. Squeeze in the question in the middle right here, please. Uh, Hei Yun Kim from the Asia Society Policy Institute. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My question is about the Fukushima radioactive water that's very likely going to be released. And do you foresee any possible challenges after this trilateral summit that getting in the way of improving the relations between Korea and Japan? Thank you. Take it all in, and you guys yeah, can choose. Pick and Thank choose. Should we just say yes? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Igor from the South China Morning Post. You guys said that we should expect some announcements on technology. I was wondering to what extent the Biden administration will encourage both Japan and South Korea to join the U.S. lead on curbs to investment on Chinese advanced technology. Thank you. Mary, do you want to start? And then I'll go down. Um, I'm happy to um, take the question on Taiwan. Um, I'll note that in the past, um, in our last statement in uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, uh, there's already significant language um, in which we take a trilateral position on Taiwan. I think it's very clear. Um, it's certainly something the president raises in every meeting with close partners. It's an issue that matters deeply and is close to all of our hearts. Each one of our countries um, has a clear position on the importance of peace and stability in Taiwan. So I would expect that to come up. And I would say to your good question, uh, one of the things that is important in these trilateral settings, and I've witnessed it myself, is each leader thinks it's important to update on specific national initiatives or other things that we're 
uh, working towards. So I would fully expect that President Biden would explain his rationale and the steps that the U.S. government is taking, both with respect to outbound investment, other initiatives that we're likely to take in the realms of the IRA implementation and the like. Our uh, uh, partners are uh, continually engaging in those discussions. We have very active dialogues on all things that we're doing on the technology front. And I think it would be fair to say that both Japan and South Korea are more aligned uh, on technology-related issues than I think uh, are widely understood. I do also believe that um, there have been um, uh, discussions among all three countries about Fukushima. Um, I believe that the IEA has been very clear about its findings. I think that has been accepted uh, as, uh, generally uh, in uh, all three countries. Um, and uh, I believe that there will be continuing appropriate discussion, uh, discussions among all three. Rump? Uh, one is if, if you looked at all three countries in the last year and produced their own national security documents, as it relates to the overall view, every one of them are not only co complementary of each other, any one of us could have written the other one, cutting trees national security documents. And this is a byproduct of that kind of common vision, shared foundation. Two, to uh, Fukushima. I'm going up at the end of the month. I'm going to go have dinner up in Fukushima. Fish dinner. They have been unbelievably transparent. I say this, they brought the international community in, been unbelievably scientifically based in their uh, efforts of being uh, forthright with the public. A lot different than basically saying we're not publishing youth unemployment numbers anymore. And second is that, thank you very much for laughing at that one. Uh, <laughs> second is uh, you take a look at the four nuclear plants by China on the coast. It's close to four to five times worse when it comes to sense of the distribution into the water of uh, nuclear material or any type of that. Japan has done a heroic effort over the years to do exactly what they're supposed to do to be a good citizen, corporate, or good world citizen. That is in direct com uh, contrast to what China's done with their nuclear plants. And have been forthright with all the information and transparent over the years. And then third, I would just say, as it relates to uh, trade and economics, one is uh, we just ended the fourth year in a row where Japan is the number one foreign direct investor in the United States. And the United States, for the four consecutive years, is the number one direct investor in Japan. Second is that the United States has now replaced China and Korea being the number one uh, exporting market. Uh, and I think that uh, the economics of each other's countries, the investments in either agriculture or automotive technology, is reflective of the fact that there's a, not only a great deal of economic opportunity in all three countries, you actually are going to start investing in countries that respect the rule of law, investing in countries that give you legal certainty, and respecting in countries where information is transparent so you can make a good decision based on the bottom line of the business. And that is actually what is bringing a lot of countries together. Just, just one thing on this good point that Ron. Hey, Kurt's going to pay for the dinner. Yeah. And for <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to do it. Thanks. Okay. Um, the uh, the idea of uh, the investment and the engagement between our countries uh, does not get enough attention. And so, in the two and a half years since President Biden has been uh, the president of the United States, uh, just give you an example. South Korea has invested over $100 billion in the United States in new technological pursuits. That is a remarkable uh, vote of confidence, and the same dynamic is underway with Japan as well. So I think, um, you know, I, I, again, uh, Dimitri warns us not to be too optimistic. There are times in global politics where it's appropriate to focus on an important step, and this is one of those times. I think that's a terrific way to close our conversation. So Ambassador Emanuel, Kurt, and Mira, I want to thank you again for stopping by Brookings to just share your thoughts. Um, I do want to ask the audience to stay and remain seated until our speakers can walk out the door because they have to get to their next event. But thank you again to our audience, those online as well, too. And thank you again to our speakers and to our terrific staff. Thank you.